Okay, moving down to our next scenario with site 1, 2, and 4 as a requirement to have the internet access, which is being simulated by the switch 1 loopback 42. Now, task number 2 with internet, we need to configure R4 to provide internet connectivity to switch 1 loopback 42 from R6 to 7 or R8 loopback 10 through 12. The traffic must follow a default route, so we somehow have to configure a, a default route and then advertise that to all of the MPLS sites. We must be prepared for possibility of overlapping IP between the customers. This is right here pretty much call for a network address translation. And we require to not to configure any additional static routes on switch one. And then anything that's being accomplished in task one must continue to function. Okay, so going back to our diagram now, we're going to have to provide internet connectivity. So that is our loopback 42 on switch one. So what we're going to do is to perform a NAT on the router R4. So once the traffic follow the default route and then hits R4 or traverse R4, it will be translated to a address that belongs to the subnet right here since we're not allowed to configure any more static routes on switch one to point back to R4. So the network that the traffic is translated to has to be coming from the directly connected subnet. So we're just going to do a path to the IP on the fast 00 on R4. Okay, just to keep things simple. And that really isn't anything else we need to do because the route import export has already been taken care of in our task number one. Okay, so the majority of the configuration, or actually all the configuration, is going to be done on R4. Okay, let's go over to R4. First, configure static default routes as part of the provider BRF with the quant zero, pointing to switch one, 104.10. Always name the default route if you can, or name a static route if you can. And then on the router BGP 100, address family IPv4 VRF provider. We're going to advertise our default route and we're just going to use the network command here. And then for the NAT, we need to match the interesting traffic for the NAT. So we'll first come up with an access list. We're going to call it VRF NAT. And if you remember in task number one, all of the traffic is required to not be NATed when it access the switch run loop back 10. So we need to make sure that we bypass that in our access list. Instead of immediately doing permit IP any any, we first have to deny any traffic that's heading towards the the share subnet, okay, slash 24, so it'll be 000 0.255. And then we can permit anything else. Okay, now with our NAT statement, it's just the regu regular regular uh, pat with IP NAT inside source list, then VRF NAT. And we're going to add that to an interface, fast 00 on router 4. And since we are dealing with a particular VRF, VRF provider, we're going to have to specify that in the NAT statement as well. So VRF provider. And since we're, there, we're padding, we have to specify the overload option. Okay, so next we have to specify the NAT inside outside interface. So NAT outside will be our fast 00 since the traffic is coming from the MPLS network heading towards the site and then all these three serial interface facing the MPLS core is going to be NAT inside. So fast 00 will be IP NAT outside and then 000 it will be IP NAT inside 01 and 02. You need to make sure that you account for all of the possible interfaces that the traffic can be coming into and that should be all we need as far as configuration. Before we begin our testing, let me hop over to switch one and do a debug IP ICMP. We clear the lock. Now that we've done that we can go over to R6 and do a ping to switch one lead back 42 which is our simulated internet. Okay so that's okay. Next is our R7. That is pinging. And also R8, and that is pinging as well. 
Okay, so now going back to the switch and do show IP, we're actually going to the router app 4 first and do show IP net translation VRF provider. You can see all of these net entries, one for each of the router, this is for R6, R7, and R8. And you can see that this is specifically for the, the, the net table under the VRF provider. Let me just show access list. You can see that there is a uh, nine matches. That's a result of our test ping. And then if we go back and make sure that we didn't break anything in task one, go back to the router R6 and then ping switch one loopback 10 sourcing from loopback 10. So you can see that's still working. Just to verify everything, let's take a look at the our Debug output for ICMP, you can see that all of these outputs are from the R6, R7, and R8 pings that got natted. So this was coming in using all of the identical IPs, which is our four fast 0, 0 interface. And then the final test ping that we did to switch one the back 10, it came through as an R6 native IPs. Okay, so we have pretty much successfully provide all of our sites and internet access with a advertisement of a default route and also the for aware NAT that we just implemented in R4 as well. And that's complete our task number two. So you can see that implementing a share services in the MPLS VPN using the VRF approach is much simpler than using the global routing if you haven't still watch our previous video that used the default VRF because there's less command involved to configure since you don't have to deal with individual VRF and the egress PE. So basically if you do a default VRF on the share services, as you've seen in the previous video, you have to configure all of the customer's VRF on the egress PE routers for all of the customer's VRF that needs access to that share service. As you see in this video, we only need to create one VRF, which is our provider VRF, and then do the route import. And also here we don't have to deal with manually placing the return traffic if it were to come from a default VRF into each of the individual VRF. Here the return traffic is taken care of automatically for you when you using the, the VRF approach, just like how we did in this lab. And also we the command like the IP NAT statements or even the static route have to configure it. We didn't have to do per VRF anymore. It's just one sets of command for the provided VRF. So the commands are less from that perspective as well. But the main problem with this approach is with the share services P router needs to import all of the customer routes, just how we saw with the RT import right here. So this prevents all of our customers from having the overlapping IP, which is very much likely the case. And this is why sometimes when you order a share services from the provider, like a SIP trunk, usually the provider will give you their own unique IP to use to communicate with their server. And that way they can guarantee that any traffic that's coming towards the share services all have the unique source IP and don't have to deal with the overlapping subnet. But nevertheless, this is definitely a more scalable approach in implementing the share services on the MPLS VPN. Okay, so that's pretty much wraps up our video on MPLS VPN share service and internet using VRF. You can visit the website to view an extensive list of our lab videos and sign up to get access to additional lab contents. Thank you for watching labmins.com and I'll see you guys in the next video.